armed with what looked like a handgun with like a laser sight as well. He had like a laser too. That'd be terrifying. I'd be like, I'm about to get shot. Yeah, I would think it was like some about to get happened murdered. to me, I would think they're like coming for me, the CIA. And this intruder ordered them to lie face down on the bed and then secured them with zip ties and placed swim goggles over their eyes. <sighs> which the lenses of the swim goggles were taped over so they could serve as blindfolds. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of Where Is. So today's episode is a little different um, because we are actually talking about a missing infant. It's a very, very frustrating story that I'm sure you guys will have your own theories and opinions on. But before I get into that, I do want to let you guys know that we are, of course, doing another campaign for Thorn. This is the new design. I love this one. This was designed by a subscriber, so it's completely original, and her name is Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. I love this design. I think you guys are going to really like this one as well. I'm excited to see how many sales we will have from it. So it's available in long sleeve and short sleeve, a couple of different colors, and 100% of the profit goes directly to Thorn. If you didn't know, Thorn is an organization that is fighting back against the exploitation of children and the human trafficking of children. So it's an extremely important cause that is very, very dear to my heart. I'm even wearing my Defend Happiness shirt today. But let's go ahead and get into this case, you guys. So today we're gonna be talking about Sabrina Ainsberg. These are her parents, Marlene and Steve Ainsberg. And she also had two siblings. She had a brother named William and a sister named Annika. And the family lived in a safe community in Tampa. They knew most of their neighbors. It was a really great setup for their kids. and. They were a happy family. On November 23rd of 1997, the family had watched a movie together. It was a Sunday night. Um, they had a good night together. Everything was fine. And they put their kids to bed and went to sleep just like normal. Um, the next morning, November 24th of 1997, Marlene woke up and she's actually given mixed statements of what woke her up. Uh, she said the fish tank and she said the TV. And I believe she may have even said the alarm, but I'm not sure. Uh, it might've just been like the TV alarm or something like that. So she gets up when she got into her kitchen she's quoted saying this I then noticed that the laundry room door to the garage was open and I'm like whoa what is that doing open and then I just ran to the first bedroom and I look in Sabrina's crib and she was gone that would be terrifying you wake up you see that your garage door is right open someone could walk right into your house and I look and notice my laundry room door to out to my garage is opened and then as I get closer I'm looking now out to the street and seeing that my garage door is up so now I'm just looking straight out to the street. And the first room closest to this door was baby Sabrina's nursery. And they believe that she was taken right out of her crib. And this is pretty unusual. I mean, it doesn't happen very often where a baby is taken out of their like bedroom in their crib. And this is the 911 call that Marlene made after finding that Sabrina was gone. 911. What you're watching right now is the last footage of Sabrina. They had no idea, obviously, that this footage would be the last that they would have. So the Ainsbergs had unintentionally left their garage door open overnight. Marlene says she frantically runs to her next door neighbor's house. And I opened the door and she said, my baby's gone, my baby's gone. And I said, what do you mean your baby's gone? And I put my arm around her shoulder and she said somebody came in and took my baby. And that's believable. I mean, at least in my house, because my parents forgot to shut the fucking garage door all the time. They're not sure if the interior door was locked or not. Chances are not. But there was actually no sign of forced entry at all. No footprints, no fingerprints, nothing was found. Their house obviously became an instant crime scene and they were on the news all the time. And obviously since this was so bizarre, people started to be suspicious of them. The deputies took several items from the Ainsberg home, including Sabrina's crib and bedding, and they were sent to an FBI lab to be looked over by them. You've done any, anything differently about securing the house? Oh, for or sure, what, my God. Like, what would you have done differently? What we do now. I look at the doors every night and we make sure they're shut and locked and we turn the alarm on. Every night we kick myself, ourselves, because we didn't use an alarm and we had one. <laughs> 
course we would do things differently. We're searching for Sabrina. They had a dive team go out and look, and you know, they're searching for a baby. It's so, so upsetting. Uh, but you know, obviously the whole community is upset. So later that day, the Ainsbergs decided to record a public appeal, um, trying to, you know, if there's anyone out there, because chances are, if you're gonna take a baby, you're not gonna take the baby and kill it, or like, do anything weird to it. Chances are whoever took this baby, if someone did, they took it to raise the baby and have a child. Maybe someone who couldn't have a baby. That actually has happened before. And the police also think there's a high possibility that it could have been a woman because it's often mothers who don't have the ability to have children who end up stealing other people's babies most of the time. So at 9.30 p.m. that night, a appeal from the parents aired on TV. Please bring our baby back to us. She needs her mother and her father, and we all miss her and love her very much, and we need her to come home to us, please. And people's reactions to it were really mixed. For some reason, they came off kind of odd. I don't know, what do you guys think? Hey. It took all the strength that I had to say what I said, and then the minute I was done, I broke down in tears. Okay, hysterical. But of course, the cameras were not put on me then. Arlene was seen by some as being not authentic, unemotional. Law enforcement seemed to focus in on that display. So I don't know, I mean, it definitely doesn't scream guilty to me and it's very hard to judge people's behavior when they've just lost their child. I don't know, something felt weird about the whole thing and I think from the beginning they felt like people didn't believe them because it was so odd. So I don't know, maybe that kind of made them act weird, the fact that they didn't feel like completely believed, which can you imagine if your child went missing and then you were blamed for it and it wasn't you? I mean, oh my God, how frustrating. And I'm not saying that it wasn't them because I don't really know, but if you can imagine what that would be like if they didn't do it. I mean, it, horrific. You understand that the police had to investigate you. Oh, for sure. Investigate us, but follow other leads. The statistics show that when a baby is abducted, there's only one chance in a thousand that someone other than a family member did it. Well, guess what? You meeting number one. All right. And then something happened that made them look really bad. This became a pretty popular case because it was so unique. There were a lot of camera crews filming them and filming their house and them coming out of their house. And the day after Sabrina vanished, the couple was filmed, both of them laughing. And they claim that their attorney made a joke, but it just doesn't seem like, that's hard. That's the one thing about this that really gets me. I know grief is dealt with differently, but like, I don't see how you could like find any joy or laughing or even be thinking about a joke when your baby went missing like 24 hours ago. That's just so bizarre to me. But I mean, certainly doesn't show that they're guilty. It is just odd. Investigators took that video of Sabrina and they zoomed in on it and they claimed that there were possible bruises or marks on her head, signifying abuse, which the other two kids were like, no way our parents do not abuse use us. But it definitely is something to be considered. However, when it was brought up to the couple, they were disgusted by it. Um, that's when the distrust with the police really started to happen. They just felt so angry. They both voluntarily took polygraph tests. Steve completely passed and Marlene's came back inconclusive. And the thing about lie detector tests is they're definitely not always accurate, not even close. The technology gets better and better over time, but it definitely doesn't prove someone's innocent or guilty. If it was a for sure thing, obviously we'd just give every single suspect a polygraph test and if they were lying, then they go to jail, you know? But that's not how it works. It is is not completely foolproof and so a lot of the times people come back inconsistent when they are telling the truth just because they're nervous or they're upset she did just lose her baby months went on without seeing Sabrina without anyone finding her without any reports police started really really pushing them really started making them feel uncomfortable and so they decided to stop communicating with the police and hire lawyers now this looks really bad because obviously they already look bad in the media they're caught smiling they're, you know all these weird little things but then they stop working with police and hire attorneys. Now this just looks horrible, but it does make sense. I mean, if you felt like the police were starting to blame you for something you didn't do, which happens in this country way too fucking much, there are way too many people in prison who should not be there. It is very normal to get yourself an attorney in that situation. A lot of people don't trust police and they felt like they couldn't trust the police in that area. The police sitting across from me who I think are gonna help me, 
tell me that they think I know something about my baby. At one point, they were in danger of losing their other two children because child services was called in. And of course, they determined these children are completely loved and completely safe, and they were never taken from them. They determined that nothing was wrong with the household. Um, it was messy, but it was messy a lot. There's three kids living there. Came back squeaky clean. They couldn't find anything on these people, no sign of abuse. So. People started making up rumors, just making shit up. At one point, the father was accused of killing the baby. There were reports that she had cheated and the baby wasn't his. He found out and he killed the baby. But all of this is speculation. There's zero proof of any of it. So then time went by and eventually the police decided to bug their house. So record them in their own home without their knowledge. And this became a really big deal in this case because there are recordings. So they got indicted and had to go to court. They both had to pay a $25,000 bond. The indictment from the investigators said that they said this. They quoted Marlene saying, the baby is dead and buried. It was found dead because you did it. The baby's dead no matter what you say, you just did it. That didn't even make sense. That was like such an odd thing to say. Then they quoted Steve saying, we need to discuss the way we can beat the charge. I would never break from the family pact and our story. Even if the police were to hold me down, we will do what we have to do. They also claimed that they heard Steven saying, I wish I hadn't harmed her. Apparently Marlene replied to this and said, yeah, so, so in a way, you know, that means nobody knows what we did still. Exactly, her husband said. These tapes were the backbone of the prosecution's entire case. But can you hear what's on them? Listen closely. <laughs> Evidence. When it was played in open court, the judge looked over at the prosecutor and he had his glasses on the end of his nose. And that look was a glare. <laughs> this is the best you got. But when it was presented to a judge, he threw it out and said they couldn't use this because it was unaudible. So it's basically the same as playing a song backwards and pretending that it says something that it doesn't or thinking you hear something. There's no proof that they actually said any of these things. It was so hard to hear that you, you can't even tell what they're saying. So that evidence was completely thrown out and the judge ruled these faulty. And not only that, in February of 2004, an appeals court awarded them over $1.5 million in defense fees because they proved that that evidence was just fucking fabricated. Well, police told the judge that Marlene's 911 call was, quote, unemotional. Oh, God, my baby is gone! My baby is gone! People think that they got away with murder, and another reason why is because when they were in court, they pleaded the fifth. They used their Fifth Amendment right to be silent, and a lot of people took that negatively, but at this point, I think they just wanted to keep this as clean and have their lawyers represent them. Eventually, they had to move to Maryland. Main reason that they said that they moved was because they couldn't raise their children to respect the police in that area. So, as time went on, a woman actually contacted them saying that she found a baby on a missing persons website that looks like Sabrina. Here is the picture. Um, definitely looks super, super similar. However, we do not know who this baby is or was, and the FBI claims they did DNA, and it's not Sabrina. Later on in 2008, a dude in jail claimed that he was asked by the parents to rent a boat, use a boat so that they could toss the baby's remains in the water and the, the guy ended up telling them that he made the whole thing up. There was no proof of it either. They didn't have a boating license. It just made no sense. Marlene and Steve have never given up on Sabrina. They still talk about her as she is alive. They believe she is alive and now she'd be about 20. She was born in the same year as my sister so she'd be going on 21 this June and it's very possible that Sabrina is still out there. And that's definitely why I wanted to touch on this case specifically, because if you see someone that looks like Sabrina that's adopted or, or any weird circumstances, it could be her. So what's really crazy and interesting about this is there are two women right now who think they might be Sabrina, that they've contacted the Ainsbergs and they're currently being tested for DNA. It takes three to six months. So you should follow me on Twitter because I will definitely be following this because I'm, I'm fascinated by it. One of the girls claims that there are no baby pictures of her before five months, that that's when her baby pictures started. She never felt like she fit in. She found out that her social security number 
wasn't even real. It was forged and some other woman in California had her social security number. There's all these other sketchy little things and I'm not sure too much information on the other girl, but both of these people, their identities are not public but they are testing the DNA. And I thought DNA would be faster than three to six months, but apparently it's a really long process. We're still waiting to hear if either of them actually are Sabrina. Wouldn't that be a crazy ending to this story? The parents really believe that something like this could happen and that it only takes someone to recognize a picture or compare themselves to their other two kids and say, hey, I kind of look like those kids. So in my own opinion about this, um, I definitely can't say that the parents are innocent, that I don't think they did it at all. However, I definitely lean in that direction. I feel like I have a pretty good read on people and I know that police do pull a lot of bullshit. Like since I've learned so much about that, it makes me question police, but it is possible that they did something and they've covered it up. But they just did an interview on ABC. They're still looking for exposure. You feel confident that she's still alive. Oh absolutely. yeah, absolutely. The Eisenbergs have long moved on to Maryland where they currently live and now work as real estate agents and they keep a room open for Sabrina. Sabrina has a room in our home. We changed the room a few years ago from taking out all the Beanie Babies and toys because she's 20 years old now. There is still hope on all sides that one day we're going to find an answer about what really happened to Sabrina Eisenberg. If you had murdered your kid and then just said they were kidnapped, wouldn't you just lay low forever? I mean, it's weird for them to be actively looking for her and testing DNA and stuff. So to me, I really don't think that they did anything. If you recognize Sabrina or you think you are Sabrina, there's information below to call the Hillsboro Sheriff's Department and let them know. And I'll also leave the family's, you know, Facebook and stuff below in case you have any good information. It's a really interesting case. You know, I really, really hope Sabrina's alive and I really hope she comes back. I'd be very interesting to see where she went and what she's been through the last 20 years. So pretty crazy stuff here guys. Definitely want to know your thoughts. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you liked this case and you want to see more like it. And that's it for me today guys. Be sure to check out that Thorn design. Remember 100% of it goes to Thorn and Thorn's doing amazing work for children who have gone missing and are exploited. I hope you guys are having a great day and I'll see you next time. Bye. Where'd you go?